Scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Paolo the Murderer. Hello there. We told you the bloody story of Billy Gould, the sailor union representative on Grays Harbor who ruled the local waterfront with murder and force. And we found a page in our hometown scrapbook that tells the story of Wild John Tornow, the demented killer of the Minucci. They are not what could be described as pleasant stories. But they are yarns that Grace Harbor takes a somewhat questionable pride in as relics of the roaring past. But there is a third story that rivals in somewhat less spectacular way the tales of the lawlessness that were written by Ghoul and Tornow. It's the story of Franz Paolo, the story that rocked Grace Harbor back in the spring of 1918 and that came to a dramatic conclusion on the storm-tossed waters of the Atlantic Ocean in the autumn of 1931. For circumstances for the drama, for history that reads like fiction, the story of Franz Polo is one of Grace Harbor's best. So when George Edgar has taken the customary few seconds for our sponsor, we'll open the hometown scrapbook to the story of Franz Polo, the German sailor. All right, George, it's your turn right here. Franz Polo was an alien. He had been born in Germany and had served in the German Navy, and in 1912 he deserted from the Navy and began a tramp around the world that took him to Australia, Holland, Mexico before he came to the United States. You would have known the Grays Harbor of 1916 to understand how this floating character could land and strike and become part of this obscure port, but it was sufficient to say that Gray's Harbor of those years was an inviting place for travel-weary drifters. Franz Paolo not only stopped on Gray's Harbor, but he settled down in the uneasy, temporary way of a sailor. He took a room at the Queen Lodging House on 9th Street at Hopeland. He made some friends along the waterfront. He got into business, well, learned more about that business as we get into the story. Now, the Grays Harbor, yes, the America of 1917 and 18, was not a welcoming spot for a German who didn't embrace the laws and ways of America. In Illinois, a German who cursed the draftees marching to the railroad station was hanged by the citizens. Anti-German incidences were not uncommon on Grays Harbor, but Franz Paolo seemed to get along. He didn't talk politics, kept to himself in a shadowy background of the waterfront, and made his friends on the fringe of the law. Charles Forstrom was one of them. Forstrom was a clerk for Olaf Ron Kamen, who ran a clothing store on 8th Street in Hopeland. It was Saturday night in March 1918, on the 31st of March, to keep the evidence intact, that Forstrom and Paolo were seen together. Forstrom had called his home to say that he would be home at the usual time on Saturday night, about 9.30, shortly after the store closed. But an hour later, Mrs. McDonald, who lived not far from the store, was startled by two men arguing and talking loudly who came onto the front porch and then went away. They were Forstrom and Paolo. They walked away in the direction of the northwestern mill dock. It was shortly after 11 o'clock when the watchman at the mill, Bill Tomlin, heard four shots, followed by a scream. He hurried in the direction of the noise and caught a glimpse of a man running. The bridge tender of the 8th Street Bridge heard the shots and kept his hands over his ear to look down the river in the darkness. All he could see was a small launch cruising the river near the mill's wharf. The neighbors around the mill heard the scream and shots. And a call to the Hoakland Police Department brought Sergeant Carnine and Police Officer Jensen to investigate. Accompanying Tomlin, they searched the docks and found Forstrom, shot through the head, with his face and throat slashed, dying amongst the lumber piles. It was no April Fool's joke that Grace Harbor awoke 
to the last Sunday morning, it was the grim sight of murder. The words went through the harbor like, not, like lightning. The Hoquiam newspaper bold-faced the story, and the police of both cities began the search for a man who shows the signs of flight. For all evidence pointed towards a t terrific battle on the docks before Forsman was overcome. The 245 streetcar was about to leave Hoquiam that afternoon when Wallace Van Gilder picked up a passenger at 20th Street heading for Aberdeen. The man was scratched. He had been bleeding and appeared to have been in a fight. Van Gelder questioned him casually, and the man said that he had been held up and slugged, then robbed of $65 while on his way to catch the Al train to the Hoquiam Depot before night. But Van Gilder thought there might be more to that story. When the man got off the car at the corner of Wishka and F Street in Aberdeen, Van Gilder turned the streetcar over to the motorman and followed the passenger. Just before the man turned into the Cass Cigar Store on the corner of Heron and F Street, the conductor spotted Officer John Gear and told the story. Gear watched the cigar store while Van Gilder returned to Hoquiam, where Officer Dick Graham of the Hoquiam Police Force met the car. Graham heard the details, then called Aberdeen Police Chief George Dean and hurriedly drove to Aberdeen. The two officers arrested Franz Paulo in the Case Cigar Store a half an hour later and told him on the sus and held him on suspicion of murder, except for his bloody clothes, a bloody knife in his pocket, his scratched his scratched and cut face. There was no evidence that he was the man they sought, but they played a hunch. Franz Paulo sat in the cell in the Aberdeen jail and denied that he had anything to do with Forrest Strum's death. But Graham and Dean went to work. A scratch on Paulo, a search of Paulo's room at the Queen's Lod, lodging house produced a bloody handkerchief. Another was found on the dock near where Forrest Strum's body was found. A revolver with a broken butt was found on the deck and two trails of blood were located one leading to Forsman, the other cut off for the mill yard. Mary Lund, who operated the Queen Lodging House, reported that a knife, a flashlight, and a revolver had been stolen from her son's room several months before. Paulo was held as a suspect, and his room searched, but nothing was found. The stolen articles had belonged to her son Charles, who was now in the army. If he were recalled, he might identify the gun as his. They were, there were bloodstains in all of Foreman's pockets indicating that the robbery had been the motive. Confronted with the hastily gathered evidence, Paolo wept and denied his guilt. Paolo was not well known to Grace Harbor, in fact, but a few waterfront characters knew anything about the man. But the police had connected him with liquor, with liquor activities. Officer Graham of the Hoquiam Force questioned Rokanian, Forstrom's employer. Rokanian admitted giving Forstrom $90 with which to purchase several cases of liquor from Paulo. Forstrom believed to have had the money with him when the two men were last seen together. But an examination of Forstrom's coat, which he had left at the store before closing that Saturday night, turned up the money. It pointed the finger to Paulo. How it Ever, a police deduced that the German sailor had lured Forstrom into the mail yard on the guise of turning the liquor over to him, then murdered him for the money. It was circumstantial evidence, but the web was drawing around Paulo closer. Prosecuting attorney Bill Tucker of Aberdeen charged Paulo with murder in the first degree. The trial was set for May, and the jury was, was called. Grace Harbor buzzed with the Paulo case, the man's nationality, his former service in the German Navy, the spy scar across the nation, all contributed to the apprehension about the case. People who predicted the trial would uncover spy activities were sure they were right when Paulo attempted to saw the bars out of his cell two weeks before the trial began. When the case went to the Superior Court in Monoceno, there was less interest in Paulo than in the facts surrounding the man. 
he had vowed vengeance on Prosecutor Bill Tucker if he was convicted. Not since Billy Gould had local justice had such a tough character to deal with. A jury of Sheridan Root, M. L. Burney, Blanche Ziegler, L. A. Church, Eva Peterson, Guy Fillmore, George Ford, Bella Hitcher, L. A. Lemon, J. T. Shelby, Gertrude Hood, Hurt, and Bill Hatch was impaneled. A parade of witnesses laid the evidence before Judge Ben Sheik's court. In four days, the jury took the case, and at 1.10 the following morning found Franz Paolo guilty of murder in the first degree. On June 8, 1918, he was sentenced to serve a life time sentence and went into the state prison at Walla Walla. Grace Harbor closed the books on the grizzled crime, but Franz Paolo was not out of the news. There was another chapter coming. Before we start that phase of the story of this criminal, let's give George and our sponsor a few minutes of our time. Franz Paolo served eight years for of his life sentence for murder and then was released from prison with the provision that he leave the United States and never return. Grace Harbor noted the brief announcement and observed that it was good riddance for poor specimens. The gay 1920s passed him. Paolo was all but forgotten. Only his prosecutor, W.H. Tucker, now a bank president, gave thought occasionally to the man who had vowed vengeance on him. Once Paolo sent a word of greeting to Tucker through a seaman who came to port from a foreign ship. And then suddenly, the entire nation was electrified by the name of Franz Paolo. It was September 1931. In a Long Island Yacht Harbor, a luxurious yacht of Benjamin F. Collins was boarded by a pirate. Collins was killed and his wife was abducted. The yacht was, lo was looted by a man who left only fingerprints to identify him. They were the fingerprints of Franz Paolo. The FBI, the police, the Coast Guard pressured the pirate and his hostage, and they found them in Quincy, Massachusetts. On the waterfront, a battle ensued. The man disappeared, and not until several days later was it learned that he had stolen a small boat, forced its captain to leap over the side and swim ashore, and had sailed out of Quincy into the open Atlantic alone and desperate. The Coast Guard watched the beaches, and the revenue officers enforcing the dry laws along the shoreline doubled their alert. But Franz Paolo had other ideas. He sailed for his homeland, now seething in the political upheaval of the German paper hanger named Adolf Hitler. But the fates that had preserved his useless life abandoned him. Off the coast of Holland, just a day sailing from his destination, a storm smashed his little boat and washed it onto the beach in the Netherlands. Franz Paolo was presumed lost at sea. Again, there was no evidence that he had perished. Only the smashed boat and some of his clothing. Some of the people said that Paolo had lived, had joined Hitler's party, and no doubt would tell you that under another name he became a high-ranking Nazi officer. But George W. Tucker believed that Franz Paolo had come to an end of his crime-ridden road. He had a story to tell. Tucker mused when he heard the story of the wreck. Now he will never tell it again. But the reckless, lawless story of Franz Paolo lived, and the chapter that he left here in Grace Harbor provides us with tonight's page in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>